truth in its essence is not a something. It is a somebody. His name is Jesus Christ. When truth is called a lie, the light go out, darkness falls, and indeed, if your light is darkness, how very deep will the darkness be? All the words in this book can be compressed into one word, the eternal word, Jesus the Christ. So now we prepare to undertake what I consider one of the most important, and because of that, a little bit intimidating subjects that we have, a subject of the greatest importance, because what we're about to speak about is the Blessed Eucharist, and that which is the source and the center and the summit of our Christian faith is obviously all-important. And so, the Holy Eucharist. Well, the Holy Eucharist, we know, completes Christian initiation. Those who have been raised to the dignity of the royal priesthood by baptism and configured more deeply to Christ through confirmation participate with the whole community in the Lord's own sacrifice by means of the Eucharist. At the Last Supper, on the night he was betrayed, our Savior instituted the Eucharistic sacrifice of his body and blood. This he did in order to perpetuate the sacrifice of the cross throughout the ages until he should come again, and so to entrust to his beloved spouse, the Church, a memorial of his death and resurrection, a sacrament of love, a sign of unity, a bond of charity, a paschal banquet in which Christ is consumed. The mind is filled with grace and a pledge of future glory is given to us. In those beautiful words, the Catechism of the Catholic Church begins to speak to us. I hope to speak to our hearts as well as our minds about this preeminent sacrament, the sacrament of all sacraments, a sacrament which is not only a sacrament, but which is the Lord himself, the source of all grace, the source of all goodness. As I have said now several times, the Church teaches that the Blessed Eucharist is the source and the summit of our Christian faith. It's also the center of that Christian faith. The Second Vatican Council taught very clearly on this. Vatican II taught clearly that the Eucharist is the source and summit of the Church's life. The other sacraments, and indeed all ecclesiastical ministries and works of the apostolate, are bound up with the Eucharist and are oriented toward it. For in the Blessed Eucharist is contained the whole spiritual good of the Church, namely Christ himself. You can't say any more than that. In the Eucharist is contained the entire good the entire spiritual good of the Church, namely, Christ himself, our, Pasch, our Paschal sacrifice, the one who dying destroyed our death and rising restored our life. The Eucharist is the efficacious sign and sublime cause of that communion in the divine life and that unity of the people of God by which the Church is kept in being. It is the culmination both of God's actions sanctifying the world in Christ and of the worship men offer to Christ and through him to the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. We are united to the heavenly liturgy in a most special way in the Eucharist. The Eucharist really 
is the sum and summary of our faith. Now, having said all of that, I think you get the point that of all things in the church, of all that we believe, of all that we pray, of all that we exercise in liturgy, we want to get this one right. Learn the teaching of the church in everything, but in a special way in the Eucharist. Because what could be more important than that which is the source of our faith, the center of our faith, and the summit of our faith? You want to get the teaching on the Eucharist right. Let's get this one right, and then God will help to make everything fall into place. What's the sacrament called? Well, Eucharist. It's an action of thanksgiving. That's what the very word means, coming from another Greek word, Eucharistine and eulogine. That recalls the Jewish blessings that proclaim, especially during a meal, God's works of creation, redemption, and sanctification. So basically, the word Eucharist, just so you know, it's good to know the etymological derivation of words, what the word itself means, Eucharist, to give thanksgiving. It's also called the Lord's Supper, this sacrament, called the Lord's Supper because of its connection with that supper which the Lord took with his disciples on what we now call Holy Thursday. It's called the breaking of bread because Jesus used this rite as part of a Jewish meal, the Passover meal. We call it the synaxis, the Eucharistic assembly, because the Eucharist is celebrated amid, normally amidst the assembly of the faithful, the visible expression of the church, called the memorial of the Lord's passion and resurrection, because that's what it is, called the holy sacrifice, because it makes present the one sacrifice of Christ the Savior and includes the church's offering. It's called the holy sacrifice of the mass, sacrifice of praise, spiritual sacrifice, and pure and holy sacrifice because it completes and surpasses all of the sacrifices of the old covenant. So the church teaches and has always taught and always will teach that this sacrament, the Eucharist, is the sacrifice of Calvary the same sacrifice that Jesus offered on Mount Calvary to the Father in expiation for the sins of the world. That's what this sacrifice is. It's not another sacrifice. It's the same sacrifice which we enter into and make present. And I might add, if when we go to Mass, we are entering into the sacrifice of Calvary, then how should we be disposed? with what thanksgiving, with what reverence we should approach this sacrament of sacraments, the Eucharist, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. We call it the holy and divine liturgy because the Church's whole liturgy finds its center and most intense expression in the celebration of this sacrament. In the same sense, we also call it celebration the sacred mysteries. We speak of the most blessed sacrament because it is indeed the sacrament of sacraments. The Eucharistic species reserved in the tabernacle are designated by this same name. We call it Holy Communion because by this sacrament we unite ourselves with Christ who makes us sharers in his own body and blood. He draws us together and makes us one body in him through the power of his Holy Spirit. It's also called holy things, the bread of angels, bread from heaven, medicine for immortality and viaticum. It's called the holy mass from the Latin word misa. At the end of, of the Latin mass, you remember the words, ite misa es. Well, missio is ascending. So after we have partaken of the Eucharist, after we've given glory to God, adored him, thanked him, after we've entered into the sacrifice of Calvary and made it present, after we, everything that we are and everything that we do, past, present, and forever, after we unite that with Jesus in the Paschal mystery and offer it 
through within in him to the Heavenly Father. Then we're sent. Missio. That's what the Mass is. Ascending. You've been prepared, and now you're sent, filled with grace, to proclaim to all creatures that Jesus is Lord, to proclaim the good news of salvation. So we have all those different words and names that refer to this sacrament of the Eucharist. The Eucharist in the economy of salvation, it's very important to know where the Eucharist fits into in this work of salvation. We begin with the bread and wine. That's called the matter of the sacrament. Every sacrament has matter and form. There's uh, like water in baptism, the anointing with oil and confirmation in the Eucharist. We have matter, bread and wine. In the Latin rite, we use unleavened bread. In some of the Eastern rites, they use leavened bread. But we use in the Latin rite, unleavened bread. Now, what is it? It's Wheat flour, wheat flour and water, period. That's it. Don't mess with it. There is a parish. Now, it's okay when parishes make their own altar breads. That's okay. That's kind of a, a good thing to do. Uh, you participate in making the bread which is offered in, in Holy Mass. It's not a bad thing, but you want to do it right. Don't mess around. There is a parish which, for obvious reasons, not in this diocese, way far away, 3,000 miles far away. <laughs> not here. <laughs> but far, far away on the East Coast, someplace, there is a parish that for many years was making its own altar bread, and last year someone gave me the recipe. <laughs> it had in it eggs, milk, vanilla, sugar, on and on and on. It sounded like something right out of Betty Crocker. <laughs> now that seems funny, but let me tell you it wasn't because for years those people didn't have the Eucharist. No valid matter, no sacrament. And there's no the church supplies when it comes to form and matter in the sacraments. No ecclesia suplex when it comes to form and matter in the sacraments. You don't have valid matter, you don't have a valid sacrament. And so what did they receive? Bread. And that's one heck of a thing to do to the people of God. Don't mess with the essential matter of a sacrament. Wheat, flour, and water. And if there is a significant addition of other elements, it can render the matter invalid. You don't put eggs in the batter for the Eucharistic bread. You don't put sugar, vanilla, or anything else. You might have a nice tasting bread, but you don't have Jesus. And I don't care how good it tastes. It doesn't taste good to me, unless it's the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And so it's wheat flour and water. And the wine is natural wine from grapes. Canon law stipulates that it should be between 12 and 18 percent alcohol content. Now, if it's wine from grapes, thereabouts with the, you know, the alcohol content, that's valid matter. And then we'll talk about the valid form later. These signs of bread and wine have significance. They speak of the goodness of creation because they're natural elements. You know, bread and wine, those are natural elements things, they come from the earth, and so we offer God the goodness of creation in, in the gifts that we bring to the altar. We remember the old covenant offering of the first fruits. We remember the unleavened bread of the Passover. We remember that Israel lives not by bread alone, as scripture tells us. We remember the cup of blessing, which comes at the end of the Jewish Passover meal. We remember the multiplication of the loaves that Jesus performed more than once. We recall the water turned into wine at the wedding feast at Cana. So all these remembrances in, uh, in Scripture that refer to bread and wine, they find their completion, their fulfillment in the Blessed Eucharist. Number 1336 
makes a very important statement. The first announcement of the Eucharist divided the disciple, just as the announcement of the Passion scandalized them. This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? The Eucharist and the cross are stumbling blocks. It is the same mystery, and it never ceases to be an occasion of division. Will you also go away? The Lord's question echoes through the ages as a loving invitation to discover that only he has the words of eternal life and that to receive in faith the gift of the Eucharist is to receive the Lord himself. From the beginning, it has been a cause of division. Jesus said, you think I have come to bring peace? I, have te I tell you I have not come to bring peace, but to bring division. Where husband against wife, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother. And we say, how can that be? Jesus is the prince of peace. How could he say I've come to bring division? Why? Because the truth in the beginning will divide. The truth is a sword, and it will cut right to the marrow of the bone, and some will accept it, and some will not. And this is a hard saying. Who can believe it? You're telling us you're going to give us your own flesh and blood to eat? And they went away, many of them. That's the way it was in the beginning. And that's the way it is now. And that's the way I, sad to say, may, may always be until he comes again in glory. But one thing is certain. The truth in the beginning divides, but in the end it unites. You enter deeply into the truth, you enter into unity. For God is the truth, and God is one. And so if you want to unite the church, enter more deeply into the truth, which the church believes and teaches. And you will become a force for unity. Actually, there will be no ecumenism until we enter intimately and deeply into the truth which we believe and begin to live it with great fervor. And then we'll attract people to the Catholic Church. But yes, many find it hard to believe. It looks like bread. It tastes like bread. I'm supposed to believe this is Jesus himself, God? Only if you want to believe what he taught. That's what it is. But I can't understand it. Of course you can't. Neither can the angels. The greatest minds in the history of the church couldn't understand it completely. But they believed it. They believed it. And we believe. We walk by faith, not by sight. So that first announcement of the Eucharist, yes, it divided the disciples. Some went away. Today, it continues to divide. Some go away, they say, I don't buy it. I've heard people who should know better teach in places where it shouldn't be taught that Jesus isn't really there in the Eucharist. Jesus called the devil a liar and the father of lies. And the only one who wants you to believe that Jesus isn't really, truly, and substantially present in the Eucharist is Satan. For he knows that the power is in the Eucharist. The power for conversion, the power for goodness, the power to do God's holy will is in the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the greatest gift a loving God ever gave to his beloved children. And it's only the enemy of souls who wants you to believe that he's not really there. It's only a sign. How could you believe that? Are you gullible? I believe it because the Holy Spirit has given me light to see into the darkness. I may not understand it perfectly. Who could? It's a mystery. But I believe it. And that's what we're called to do. The Lord having loved those who were his own, loved them to the end, knowing that the hour had come to leave this world and, world and return to the Father, 
In the course of a meal, he washed their feet and he gave them the commandment of love in order to leave them a pledge of this love, in order never to depart from his own and to make them sharers in his Passover, he instituted the Eucharist as the memorial of his death and resurrection. And he commanded his apostles to celebrate it until his return. Thereby, he constituted them priests of the New Testament. Jesus chose the time of the Passover to celebrate the Last Supper, the first Eucharist, the first Mass. He fulfilled the Passover. Earlier, I spoke about the mystery of the Passover, the Paschal mystery, how the people of God held in captivity in Egypt at the command of Moses, who got it from God, sacrificed that Paschal lamb and put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their house and how their houses were protected from the destroying angel. And then came Jesus, the lamb of God, into time and space. And like a great warrior, he was slain. And in his death, he destroyed death. And in his rising, he restored life. And when we are covered with that blood of the lamb, the destroying angel, passes over us, we're preserved, in eternal life is ours. And so the Lord instituted the Blessed Eucharist, and he did it at the time of the Passover supper. Do this in memory of me. There is a memorial. I spoke about that word anamnesis. There is a memorial of the Lord's passion and death at the celebration of the the Eucharist. The liturgical celebration of the Eucharist has certain essential parts. Now certain parts of the Eucharist can change throughout the centuries, can change to fit the times and the culture and the language. That's all right. But essential things can't change. Now there are two essential parts, main parts of the Eucharist. There's the liturgy of the Word, and there's the liturgy of the Eucharist. The liturgy of the word is the readings, how we have towards the beginning of Mass, we have on Sunday a first reading, responsorial psalm, second reading. Then we have the gospel, the liturgy of the word, then a homily after the gospel. That's the liturgy of the word. Then we have the liturgy of the Eucharist from the offertory on. The movement of that liturgical celebration has been consistent throughout the centuries. Those essential elements can't change. We have the gathering, maybe a hymn. We all gather together because Jesus said, wherever two or more are gathered in my name, there I would be in their midst. And so we gather. We may have a hymn. We, we have that penitential rite where we confess our sins. We say maybe the, um, well, the, the, um, one of the prayers penitential rite, we call it now. And then we move towards that liturgy of the word, homily, then we have the offertory, the presentation of the gifts at the offertory, bread and wine in a collection for the needs of the poor and for the church. Then we move into the anaphora. That's the Eucharistic prayer, the prayer of thanksgiving and consecration. That's the heart of the Mass, the Eucharistic prayer. That's where we come really to the center of the Eucharist. In the preface, which is the beginning of this anaphora or Eucharistic prayer, the church gives thanks to the Father through Jesus in the power of the Spirit for all his works of creation, redemption, and sanctification. Then we have the epiclesis. We talked about that. That's the invocation of the Holy Spirit upon the gifts. We have the institution narrative, and that's where the power of the words and the action of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit makes sacramentally present the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. The anamnesis or the remembrance which follows recalls to mind the Paschal mystery. We have the intercessions where we pray for the Pope and the bishops, the priests, and all the faithful. And so you see, there's a movement of the liturgy of the Eucharist. 
The essential elements of that don't change throughout time. But certain incidental elements, the language, which way the priest faces, and so forth, certain things can change throughout history to meet changing times. But the essential things, they can never change. Now, we move into the essential, really core matter of the Eucharist, the sacramental sacrifice, which is Thanksgiving memorial and presence. It's thanksgiving and praise to the Father. Remember, we said that's what the word means. Eucharist means to give thanks. And so the Eucharist, in its celebration liturgically, is thanksgiving and praise to the Father. We thank him and praise him for all his gifts of creation and especially for the gift of his only Son and for the gift of the Holy Spirit who synthesizes and makes present all gifts. All gifts are contained in the gift who is the Holy Spirit. Then we have the sacrificial memorial of Christ and his body. And then the presence of Christ, the real presence, by the power of the Holy Spirit and through his word. First, thanksgiving and praise to the Father. Well, we have to give praise to our Father. We have to be thankful. God is a provident and loving Father. I want you right now, I'm going to do something like I do at missions and things like that and retreats. Do you have a real relationship with your Heavenly Father? Good. You bet. That's the way. I want you to have a deep personal relationship with your Father. We talk about a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and indeed, we should have that. But we need to have a personal relationship with God the Father, too. And sometimes, for many of us in this day and age, it's hard because you know many people grow up without a father today. There are a great many people who have not known the love of a father, and it's hard for many of our people today to relate to a father. They've never had one, really, and they don't really know what it means, and so we have to help them. God, our Father, is a father indeed. He is the principle without principle. He is the one who gives us life, sustains life. He loves us with a love that is beyond our wildest dreams. And we have to enter into relationship with him, our Heavenly Father. The Eucharist is indeed the memorial of Christ's Passover. Now, it's not merely a recollection of those past events. It makes them present. There is a mystical reality here. At Holy Mass, not only do we recall those events, but we make them present. You are there on Calvary. You are present. You enter into the Paschal mystery. That's what the Mass is. We don't repeat the Paschal mystery. We don't repeat the sacrifice of Calvary. We enter into that transcendent event, and we make it present in time and in space, at whatever time in history and whatever place in the world it is celebrated. We enter into it and make it present. It is a sacrifice, a true sacrifice. Now, in some places in recent years, the element of sacrifice in the Eucharist has been downplayed. It's important. It's essential. You can't do away with the element of sacrifice and have the Eucharist. It is a sacrifice because it is the memorial of Christ's Passover, number 1365. The Eucharist is also a sacrifice. The sacrificial character of the Eucharist is manifested in the very words of institution. This is my body which is given, which is given for you, and this cup which is poured out for you. In the Eucharist, Christ gives us the very body which he gave up for us on the cross, the very blood which he shed for us. That's the sacrifice of the Mass, the sacrifice of Calvary, the sacrifice of the Mass, one only sacrifice, same thing, except at Mass we offer it in an unbloody manner. We offer it sacramentally. The Eucharist is thus a sacri sacrifice because it represents, makes present, the sacrifice of the cross 
and because it is its memorial, and because it applies its fruits. Those are the three reasons why the Eucharist is a sacrifice. It makes present the sacrifice of the cross, it is the memorial of the sacrifice of the cross, and it applies the fruits of the sacrifice of the cross. The sacrifice of Christ on the cross, the Eucharist being one single sacrifice, the victim who's offered is Jesus. When we offer Mass, when we offer the sacrifice of the Mass or the Eucharistic sacrifice, who is offering? Christ is offering. There's only one priest. His name is Jesus Christ. Ordained priests are taken into the one only priesthood of Jesus. And so when the priest celebrates Mass, it's Christ who celebrates Mass. It's Christ who is working during that celebration of the sacrament. Christ is the high priest, but he's also the lamb of sacrifice, the perfect victim. And so what does the high priest offer? He offers himself. He offers himself to the Father in expiation for the sins of the world. And this is the difference between the old covenant sacrifices and between sat pagan sacrifices. The sacrifice of the new covenant is totally new, unique, different. In every other kind of priesthood, in every other kind of sacrificial offering, the sacrifice offered is a vicarious sacrifice. The old covenant priest offered a bullock, a lamb, a pigeon. The pagan priest, likewise, offered a bullock, a lamb, a pigeon, some other kind of a thing, sometimes even human sacrifice. But in the new covenant, the high priest, Jesus the Lord, offers himself the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so in this offering, we are taken up. Remember that we are one with Jesus. Baptism made us one with him. Confirmation strengthened us in him. And through the celebration of the Eucharistic sacrifice, we are taken up in the high priesthood of Jesus. And through with and in him, we offer our spiritual sacrifice our whole life. Everything that we are, everything that we do, past, present, and forever, is taken up in that sacrifice of the high priest and the Lamb of God. That's what happens at Mass. The, the sisters, when I was in grammar school, our religious sisters who taught me in school, used to teach us that we should make an offering of ourselves at Mass, that, that we should think of ourselves as being on the paten with Jesus, or in the chalice, we should unite ourselves very intimately just through an act of the will. You can do it. And then through with and in Jesus, we're offered as a sacrifice pleasing to the Father in expiation for the sins of the world. We enter into the mystery and the mission of Jesus, who through his priestly offering set the captives free. We participate in that priestly work of the Lord Jesus the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Well, we know that through the power of his word and the action of the Holy Spirit, Jesus becomes truly present in the Eucharist. Now, Jesus is really present in the church in many ways. Jesus is really present in his word, in sacred scripture. Jesus is really present in the Bible. He's really present in the church's prayer or wherever two or three are gathered, there he is. He said it himself. So he's really present in the prayer of the faithful. He is really present in the poor, the sick, and the imprisoned, because he said, if you do it for the least of my brethren, you do it for me. He's really there. He's really there in the sacraments of which he is the author. He is really there in the ministers of the sacra sacraments. He's really there in the sacrifice of the Mass. He's really there in all these ways. But as the Second Vatican Council teaches, he is present most especially and preeminently in the Eucharistic species. The Eucharist, when we say the real presence, doesn't mean that the other modes of presence aren't real. Jesus is really present in you and in me, your temple of the Holy Spirit, 
wherever one person of the Trinity is, there the other person, two persons have to be. That's a mystery, but that's a doctrine of the faith. And so, yes, Jesus is really present in many ways, but the Eucharist is not the same kind of presence as all these other modes of presence. It's a higher presence, a more powerful presence, because it is a substantial presence. God is present in virtue of his power in all these other ways. But he is present not only by his power, but by a substantial presence. Jesus is their body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. Body, blood, and soul speaks of the humanity of Christ. Divinity, well, God. And so he's there, the whole Christ, the entire Christ. Jesus is there in a mode of presence which we say is the mode of presence par excellence, the highest way of being present. The mode of Christ's presence, this is number 1374, the mode of Christ's presence under the Eucharistic species is unique. It raises the Eucharist above all the sacraments as the perfection of the spiritual life and the end to which all sacraments tend. In the most blessed sacrament of the Eucharist, the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore the whole Christ is really, truly, and the key word is substantially contained. This presence is called real, by which is not intended to exclude other types of presence, as if they could not be real too, but because it is presence in the fullest sense. That is to say, it is a substantial present, presence by which Christ, God and man, makes himself wholly and entirely present. It is by the conversion of the bread and wine into Christ's body and blood that Christ becomes present in this sacrament. Transubstantiation is a very important word. It is a word that the church has used for many, many years. It is a word that is not outdated. No one yet has come up with a word good enough to replace it. But if they did, it couldn't have any other meaning than that the substance the nature, the essence of bread and wine is transformed, changed in substance into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Any understanding less than that is insufficient, and it's not what we believe in the Catholic Church. We believe that through the words of Christ the High Priest, uttered by his ministerial priest, and the action of the Holy Spirit, when he says, take this, all of you, and eat it, this is my body, this is my blood, it becomes indeed the body, the blood, the soul and divinity of Jesus Christ, a real, a true, and a substantial presence. Christ is there, whole and entire. And you may say, but I can't see him. Of course not. We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith, as Scripture says. And so we give the assent of faith. If we could see him, we wouldn't need faith. Some of us might think it'd be a good idea if once in a while the good Lord might peek out of the tabernacle. Now, other than scaring us half to death, it might be a good idea because it would kind of help us because, admittedly, it can be difficult at times. You know, faith can be tough sometimes. But we're called to exercise faith. When you exercise faith, like exercising anything else, you strengthen it. And God wants us to have strong faith. That's what we need. And so we indeed walk by faith, not by sight. St. John Chrysostom puts it very beautifully. It is not man that causes the things offered to become the body and blood of Christ, but he who was crucified for us, Christ himself. The priest in the role of Christ pronounces these words, 
but their power and grace are God's. This is my body, he says. This word transforms the things offered. And St. Ambrose says about this transubstantiation or conversion from bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. Then Ambrose says, be convinced that this is not what nature has formed, not what nature has formed, but what the blessing has consecrated. The power of the blessing prevails over that of nature, because by the bless blessing, nature itself is changed. Could not Christ's word, which can make from nothing anything, or things that did not exist, could not Christ's word change existing things into what they were not before? It is no less a feat to give things their original nature than to change their nature. That's what I said before. The God who created everything out of nothing, is it so hard for him to make something out else out of something already existent? If he creates everything out of nothing, no pre-existent matter, God wills it into being. If he can do that, then certainly it's no problem for God to create something out of something or transform one thing into another thing. So the God who created everything out of nothing can certainly, through the power of the Spirit, change bread and wine into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. The only time and the only reason you'll have any problem with that is because you have a problem with your faith, because you're confusing faith with reason, because you want to understand what is essentially mystery. You will never understand it. I've had people say to me, all right, Father, if you can explain that to me, then, you know, once I understand it, then I'll become Catholic or I'll believe you. You've got to give the assent of faith. Faith precedes understanding. Faith, if you give it that assent, that obedience of faith, that will open the doors and help you to understand better. But if you don't give the assent of faith, not only will you never understand, but of course you'll never have faith either. So you end up with nothing. And so we need to walk by faith. So, because Christ, our Redeemer, said that it truly was his body and blood that he was offering, it has always been the church's conviction and the Council of Trent likewise holds that there takes place a change of the whole substance of the bread into the substance of the body of Christ our Lord and of the whole substance of the wine into the substance of his blood. This change the Holy Catholic Church has fittingly, fittingly, and properly, properly, called transubstantiation. And quite simply, the big word just means the substance of the bread and wine is changed, transformed into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. That's what happens at Mass. That's what happens at the Eucharist. That's what we go to adore. That's why if you have the Eucharist, you don't lack anything. That's why I can put up with anything if I can only have him. If I can have Jesus in the Eucharist, I don't need anything else. Because if you have the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, what could you possibly lack? What could you possibly lack? And I tell you, this is very important. This is crucial because if we begin to go astray, if people begin to think that Jesus isn't really there, that he's not substantially and truly there, then we will drift away. If we begin to believe that we can't go to him in person, when we come into the presence of the Blessed Sacrament, I, I'll tell you the truth. If Jesus isn't in the Catholic Church, in that substantial mode of presence, after a while I might begin to think who needs the Catholic Church. And so when you water down the teaching and people begin to believe that he's not really there, let me tell you what happens in the end. They drift away. They go someplace else where the fellowship is better. They go someplace else where the preaching is better. They just go away. Because if you don't believe Jesus is there, really, truly, and substantially, I might go away too. But I'll tell you something. He is there. 
He is there. And if he's there, then we need to be there. And we need to defend this truth. We need to live this truth. Jesus, the Lord, is really, truly, and substantially made present through transubstantiation of the bread and wine into his real, true, and substantial presence. That's a tremendously consoling truth. There is a lot of darkness spread abroad today in the church. If anybody tries to tell you that he's there in a way other than substantially present, if it's only a sign, they say, or only a symbol, go away fast. Don't listen to that stuff. He is there. I hear horror stories. I had a seminarian, not from this diocese, from another place. <laughs> really. It, was, it, it wasn't from anywhere around here. Not in California, either. Honestly. Far away. Very far. He told me that at one point, in a, in a class, it, it wasn't in seminary, I think it was in high school. He was in a Catholic high school. And they had celebrated a mass to begin the school year. And they used French bread and Coca-Cola. This was back in the 70s. And in the religion class, later that day, the teacher said, isn't it wonderful that our liturgy has become relevant, that we can now have a much more relevant uh, celebration with things we understand and, and this boy raised his hand and he said no I don't think it's very good in the first place he didn't realize that it wasn't valid in the first place right because you don't have valid matter and so he was worried I said the crumbs were everywhere and you know the janitor came in after class and he, he threw the, the French bread in the garbage and if we believe that's Jesus then how can that be good and at that point the teacher became furious, and he said, it's time we stopped worshiping crumbs. Well, if you don't believe that transubstantiation takes place, then you think it's crumbs. But if you have the faith of the church, then you know very well that it's the body, blood, soul, and, Je of, and divinity of Jesus Christ. In falling down, we worship him. We give the cult of adoration to the Eucharist. The Eucharist isn't cookie worship, as some other seminar seminarians had to endure that term in their own day. Some very good priests that I know today went through an age where they mocked it. One seminarian was thrown out, sent into exile, because he believed it's really Jesus. And he protested when they used that obscene term. Cookie worship? Cookie indeed. You'll find out someday that it's the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And so whenever you come in contact with that kind of blasphemous talk, that kind of blasphemous unbelief, go the other way. And don't be taken in by lies, for it's only the father of lies who seeks to put that across. And as one great priest And as one great priest of our own day once said, if you ever go to mass somewhere and the priest comes out dressed in the clown suit, know very well who laid out the vestments in the sacristy. It was Satan. And if you ever go into a parish where they've taken Jesus down off the crucifix and put up a woman, a woman, a female body, a female corpus on the crucifix, as someone told me today, they've recently encountered, and they are worshiping Christa, know that you have entered a house of pagan worship. And beware, because it's going on, even as we speak. And so don't get this one wrong, people of God. Don't let somebody convince you to exchange the truth of God for a lie and begin worshiping the creature rather than the creator. 
for Jesus is really, truly, and substantially present in the Eucharist. And if we have him, we can do without anything else. And we'd better have him. We'd better go to him. Because I'm going to tell you something. The answer to all of our problems don't lie in a political solution. The answer to the evil of abortion doesn't lie in a political or social solution, although we must engage in political and social action, but it will never be healed that way. The violence, the hatred, the wars, all of it will never be healed until we come before the Lord and fall down in adoration of his Eucharistic presence. You want to get rid of abortion? I'll tell you how to do it. You institute perpetual adoration in a chapel across from every abortion clinic in the world, and you'll shut them down, and they'll run. And there's no other way. There's not a shortcut. The Lord has given us the way. He said, I am the way. And so we come to him, we come to his Eucharistic presence, we come in adoration, we come in thanksgiving, we come in impetration, we come to beg him for grace and for mercy. I tell you that his perpetual adoration is instituted throughout the land, evil will be diminished throughout the land. We have the remedy, we have the medicine, we have the weapon to fight the good fight, but we'd better start using it or we're at our own risk. A classmate of mine has established more than 80 chapels of perpetual adoration throughout this country. This is a powerful work. A laywoman that I know from Wichita, Kansas, has established over 30 chapels of perpetual adoration through her hard work. It's where the power is. This is the Diocese of Sacramento. El Santissimo Sacramento. The most blessed sacrament. And that means something. That means something. And of all the dioceses in the United States of America, of all the dioceses in the world, I should think that Sacramento would be among the first to increase perpetual adoration in its parishes. If you want to enter into a work that's powerful, enter into that one. You'll do a great work for the Lord. The Eucharist is an entrance into the Paschal Banquet. We know that one day we'll share in the Banquet of the Lamb in the heavenly Jerusalem. We know that today we begin, we enter into that through communion. We need to remember that Jesus said, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life in you. We need to remember that he said, you must abide in me so that I might abide in you as I abide in the Father and the Father abides in me. We have to receive Holy Communion because we receive Jesus in Holy Communion. But in order to receive Holy Communion, we have to have the right dispositions. First of all, we are to be conscious of no grave sin. Now, this is no news to most of us. But you don't go to communion if you're conscious of mortal sin. You go to confession first. Now, that seems obvious. But I tell you, it needs to be said. It needs to be said today. In a day and age when supposedly 60% or more of Catholic women of childbearing age or taking the birth control pill, we need to be aware that many a sacrilegious communion is going on and it's an outrage and you can't just slough it off and pretend that mortal sin doesn't exist. It exists. And what is the remedy? Confession. No matter how bad your sins are, no matter if your sins be as scarlet, they can be made whiter, whiter than snow washed by the blood of the Lamb. And so we go to confession. We're sinners. We all sin. We go to confession. Then we go to communion. We approach the Holy of Holies 
only after having been purified. That means from mortal sin. We should have the other disposition, discerning the body of Christ, as St. Paul said. And so we approach it knowing what we approach. When we come up to Holy Communion, we don't come up as though we were about to get a potato chip. We don't come up there nonchalantly. We come up recollected, reverent. How reverent should we be to receive God? Pretty reverent, I'd say. We should approach him a heck of a lot more reverent and a heck of a lot more conscious than if we approached an earthly king or president. We need to think about these things. These things are important. And then having received our Lord in Holy Communion, we're given an increase of that union with Christ, which is the meaning of human life. It's spiritual food for our soul. It helps to separate us from sin. It protects us from mortal sin. It does away, it eradicates venial sin. It unites the mystical body of Christ. It brings about that unity that we hope for where one day there will be one shepherd and one flock. If our dispositions are right, my dear friends, the day will come when having been made one with Christ, we'll stand before the Heavenly Father transformed into the one that we have received. Unlike any other food which we assimilate and it becomes part of us, this bread of angels, this food for the saints, it transforms us. Jesus assimilates us into himself. We're transformed from glory to glory and then one day Standing before the Father, he will see his only Son reflected in us. And you will hear those blessed words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Master's house. God bless you.